On the 20 slides shown below, I present the original photographs of the Second World War from the German archive, which are in my collection. These photos are from my collection department, Wehrmacht on the Eastern and Western Fronts. If you like it, subscribe to my YouTube, like it, so you don't miss the new weekly presentations. If you would like to order 5 inches by 7 inches copies of these photos from the original, you can specify which photos you would like to receive. Laboratory quality. Enjoy your viewing. Helmut Weidling, German, Helmut Weidling, November 2, 1891, Halberstadt, Saxony Anhalt, November 17, 1955, Vladimir Central, Vladimir, was an artillery general of the German army. Defense commander and last commandant of Berlin. He died in prison while serving a sentence for war crimes. The assault on Berlin is the final part of the Berlin Offensive Operation of 1945, during which the Red Army captured the capital of Nazi Germany. The operation to take Berlin lasted from April 24 to May 2. On the evening of April 24, the Second Guards Tank Army broke into Berlin from the northwestern fort in the Simonstadt Rude area. The Third Shock Army fought on the northern and northwestern outskirts of Berlin. The 5th Shock Army with the 11th Tank Corps stormed Berlin from the east. The 3rd Guards Tank Army of the 1st Ukrainian Front, advancing from the south, reached the Telto Canal by the evening of April 22, crossed it on the morning of April 24, and began fighting for the southern part of Berlin. By the evening of April 24, having occupied the southeastern suburbs of Berlin, the 1st Guards Tank and 8th Guards Armies approached the city directly. The German command could only counter these forces in Berlin with the 56th Panzer Corps of General G. Weidling, which included five divisions, Munchberg Panzer Division, 28th Motorized Division, 9th Parachute Division, 18th Motorized Division and Motorized Division SS Nordland, as well as 30 Volkssturm Battalions. The basis of the defense was anti-aircraft batteries, which now acted against ground targets. At 12 noon on April 25, the 6th Guards Mechanized Corps of the 4th Guards Tank Army of the 1st Ukrainian Front crossed the Havel River and connected with units of the 328th Division of the 47th Army of the 1st Belarusian Front, thereby closing the encirclement around Berlin. By the end of April 25, the Berlin garrison was defending on an area of about 327 square kilometers. The total length of the front of Soviet troops in Berlin was about 100 kilometers. The Berlin Group, according to the Soviet command, consisted of about 200,000 soldiers and officers, 3,000 guns and 250 tanks, including the Volkssturm, the People's Militia, 9. The defense of the city was carefully thought out and well prepared. It was based on a system of strong fire, strongholds and nodes of resistance. In Berlin, nine defense sectors were created, eight around the circumference and one in the center. The closer to the city center, the tighter the defense became. Massive stone buildings with thick walls gave it special strength. The windows and doors of many buildings were closed up and turned into loopholes for firing. In total, the city had up to 400 reinforced concrete long-term structures, multi-story bunkers, up to six floors, and pillboxes equipped with guns, including anti-aircraft guns, and machine guns. The streets were blocked by powerful barricades up to four meters thick. The defenders had a large number of Faust patrons, which in the conditions of street fighting turned out to be a formidable anti-tank weapon. Of no small importance in the German defense system were underground structures, including the metro, which were widely used by the enemy for covert maneuver of troops, as well as for sheltering them from artillery and bomb attacks. A network of radar observation posts was deployed around the city. Berlin had a strong anti-aircraft defense provided by the 1st Anti-Aircraft Division. Its main forces were located on three huge concrete structures, Zubank in the Tiergarten, Humboldtine, and Friedrichshain. The division was armed with 128, 88 and 20mm anti-aircraft guns. The center of Berlin, 
cut with canals, with the Spree River, was especially strongly fortified, which in fact became one huge fortress. Having superiority in people and technology, the Red Army could not fully use its advantages in urban areas. First of all, it concerned aviation. The ram force of any offensive, tanks, once on the narrow city streets, became an excellent target. Therefore, in street battles, the 8th Guards Army of General V. I. Chukov used the experience of assault groups, proven back in the Battle of Stalingrad, two to three tanks, a self-propelled gun, a sapper unit, signal men and artillery were attached to a rifle platoon or company. The actions of the assault detachments, as a rule, were preceded by a short but powerful artillery preparation. By the evening of April 28, units of the 3rd Shock Army of the 1st Belarusian Front reached the Reichstag area. On the same night, to support the Reichstag garrison, an assault force consisting of cadets from the Rostock Naval School was dropped by parachute. This was the last visible operation of the Luftwaffe in the skies over Berlin. On the night of April 29th, the actions of the advanced battalions of the 150th and 171st Rifle Divisions under the command of Captain S. S. Neustroeff and Senior Lieutenant K. Yar. Some Sornif captured the Moltke Bridge across the Spree River. At dawn on April 30, the building of the Ministry of the Interior was stormed at the cost of considerable losses. The way to the Reichstag was open. An attempt to take the Reichstag on the move was unsuccessful. The building was defended by a 5,000-strong garrison. An anti-tank ditch filled with water was dug in front of the building, making it difficult to attack frontly. On Royal Square there was no large caliber artillery capable of making breaches in its powerful walls. Despite heavy losses, all capable of attacking were assembled into consolidated battalions on the first line for the last decisive push. Basically, the Reichstag and the Reich Chancellery were defended by the SS troops, units of the SS Division Nordland, the French battalion Fenay from the SS Division Charlemagne, the Latvian battalion of the 15th SS Grenadier Division, Latvian No. 1, as well as the SS personal guard units of Adolf Hitler, there was, according to some sources, about 600 to 900 people. According to the combat log of the 150th Infantry Division, at 1425 on April 30, 1945, Lieutenant Rukims and Koshkarbev and Private Grigory Bulatov were the first to hoist the flag on the stairs of the main entrance of the Reichstag 10. On the evening of April 30, a group of Soviet soldiers broke into the building through a breach in the northwestern wall of the Reichstag, made by sappers of the 171st Division. Almost simultaneously, soldiers of the 150th Infantry Division stormed it from the main entrance. The cannons of Alexander Bessarab, the commander of the anti-tank division of the 207th Rifle Division, pierced this passage for the Infantry 11. The tanks of the 23rd Tank Brigade, the 85th Separate Tank Regiment and the 88th Separate Guards Heavy Tank Regiment provided great assistance during the assault. So, for example, in the morning, several tanks of the 88th Separate Guards Heavy Tank Regiment, having crossed the spree along the surviving Moltke Bridge, took up firing positions on the Kronprinzenja for embankment. At 1300 hours, the tanks opened direct fire on the Reichstag, participating in the general artillery preparation that preceded the assault. At 1830, the tanks also supported the second assault on the Reichstag with their fire, and only with the start of fighting inside the building did they stop shelling it. On April 30, 1945, at 9.45 p.m., units of the 150th Infantry Division under the command of Major General V. M. Shatilov and the 171st Infantry Division under the command of Colonel A. I. Nagoda captured the first floor of the Reichstag building. Having lost the upper floors, the Nazis took refuge in the basement and continued to resist. They hoped to break out of the encirclement, cutting off the Soviet soldiers who were in the Reichstag from the main forces. In the early morning of May 1, the assault flag of the 150th Infantry Division was raised over the Reichstag, 
but the battle for the Reichstag continued all day, and only on the night of May 2 did the Reichstag garrison capitulate. On April 30, the tanks of the 11th Guards Tank Corps, together with the rifle divisions of the 5th Shock Army, made their way to the Imperial Chancellery and opened fire on it. The 2nd Guards Tank Army, together with the 1st Army of the Polish Army, fought for the Tiergarten Park. On this day, Adolf Hitler committed suicide in the bunker of the Imperial Chancellery. By the evening of April 30, between the troops of the 8th Guards and 1st Guards tank armies, who broke into the zoological garden from the south, and the troops of the 2nd Guards tank army and the 1st Army of the Polish Army, advancing from the north, there were only 600 to 800 meters. Helmut Weidling, who commanded the defense of Berlin, later testified. On the evening of April 27, it became quite clear to me that there were only two possibilities, surrender or breakthrough. Further continuation of the struggle in Berlin meant a crime. My task was to, during the next discussion of the situation in the Imperial Chancellery, outline to Hitler the futility of further struggle, and achieve agreement on the surrender of Berlin. The development of a breakthrough plan was carried out on the morning of April 28 at the command post in Bendler Block. The breakthrough was supposed to be three waves from two sides through the Havel bridges south of Spandau. Hitler and his staff were supposed to be in the third wave. Hitler thought for a long time, then in a tired, hopeless voice he said, How can this breakthrough help? Do I need to wander somewhere in the neighborhood? and wait for my end in a peasant's house or in another place. Better then, I'll stay here. Krebs supported me in my efforts to get permission to break through, however, in a very cautious manner. Finally a decision was made. With a further lack of supply from the air, troops can break through in small groups. At 10 o'clock on April 30th, on my orders, all the commanders of the sections were summoned to the Bendler block to explain to them what small groups means and to set the time for the breakthrough. In view of the fact that on the night of April the 29th to the 30th the air supply was almost completely cut off, I set the time for the breakthrough to be 10 p.m. on April 30th, about 17 o'clock I was about to go to the Imperial office, when the Sturmbonfuhrer appeared again. He was brought to me, and he handed over a note with the following content, General Weidling must immediately appear in the Imperial Chancellery to see Krebs. All events scheduled for the evening of April 30th must be postponed. About 17 o'clock I was about to go to the Imperial office, when the Sturmbonfuhrer appeared again. He was brought to me, and he handed over a note with the following content, General Weidling must immediately appear in the Imperial Chancellery to see Krebs. All events scheduled for the evening of April 30th must be postponed. I was immediately taken to the Führer's office. Goebbels, Bormann and Krebs were already sitting at the table. When I arrived, all three stood up. Krebs solemnly stated the following, 1. Hitler committed suicide at 3 p.m. 2. His death must remain a secret for the time being. Only a very small circle of people know about it. You must also pledge secrecy. 3. Hitler's body, according to his last will, was doused with gasoline and burned in a shell crater on the territory of the Imperial office. 4. In his will, Hitler appointed the following government, Reich President, Grand Admiral Dunitz, Reich Chancellor, Reich Minister Goebbels, Party Minister, Reichsleiter Bormann, Minister of Defense, Field Marshal Skirner, German Minister of the Interior, Zeisinkwart. The remaining ministerial posts are currently not filled, as they do not matter. 5. Marshal Stalin was informed about this by radio. 6. Already for about two hours an attempt has been made to contact the Russian command authorities with the aim of asking for a cessation of hostilities in Berlin. In case of success, the German government legalized by Hitler appears on the stage, which will negotiate surrender with Russia. I'm going as a parliamentarian. Late in the evening of April 30th, the German side requested a ceasefire for negotiations. On May 1st, 
At about 3.30 a.m., the chief of the general staff of the German ground forces, General Krebs, arrived at the headquarters of the 8th Guards Army of General Chukov, who announced Hitler's suicide and read out his will. Krebs conveyed to Chukov a proposal from the new German government to conclude a truce. The message was immediately passed on to Zukov, who called Moscow himself. Stalin reaffirmed his categorical demand for unconditional surrender. By May 1, only the Tiergarten and the government quarter remained in German hands. The imperial office was located here, in the courtyard of which there was a bunker at Hitler's headquarters. But on May 1, at 1800 hours, the new German government rejected the demand for unconditional surrender, and Soviet troops resumed the assault on the city with renewed vigor. The troops of the 1st Guards Tank Army, in cooperation with the rifle divisions of the 8th Guards Army, captured the zoological garden. At 18.30 on May 1, the artillery of all Soviet armies storming the center of Berlin opened massive fire, after which, on the night of May 2, the assault on the center of Berlin began. On the night of May 1, the Berlin Metro was flooded, the second assault engineering and sapper brigade under the 8th Army of General VI the offensive of the 29th Guards Rifle Corps of General G.I. Ketogurov. On May 1, units of the 1st Shock Army, advancing from the north, south of the Reichstag, connected with units of the 8th Guards Army, advancing from the south. On the same day, Two important Berlin defense centers surrendered, the Spandau Citadel and the anti-aircraft tower of the zoo. Zoo Bunker is a huge reinforced concrete fortress with anti-aircraft batteries on the towers and an extensive underground bomb shelter. In the first hour of the night on May 2, the radio stations of the 1st Belarusian Front received a message in Russian, Please cease fire. We are sending parliamentarians to the Potsdam Bridge. A German officer who arrived at the appointed place on behalf of the commander of the defense of Berlin, General Weidling, announced the readiness of the Berlin garrison to stop resistance. At 6 a.m. on May 2, artillery General Weidling, accompanied by three German generals, crossed the front line and surrendered. An hour later, while at the headquarters of the 8th Guards Army, he wrote an order to surrender, which was reproduced and, using loud-speaking installations and radio, brought to the enemy units defending in the center of Berlin. As this order was brought to the attention of the defenders, resistance in the city ceased. By the end of the day, the troops of the 8th Guards Army cleared the central part of the city from the enemy. Separate German units, who did not want to surrender, tried to break through to the west, but for the most part were destroyed or dispersed. The main direction of the breakthrough was the western suburb of Berlin, Spandau, where two bridges over the Havel River remained intact. They were defended by members of the Hitler Youth, who were able to stay on the bridges until the surrender on May 2. The breakthrough began on the night of May 2. Parts of the Berlin garrison and civilian refugees who did not want to surrender, frightened by Goebbels' propaganda about the atrocities of the Red Army, went into the breakthrough. One of the groups under the command of the commander of the 1st, Berlin, Anti-Aircraft Division, Major General Otto Seidau, was able to seep to Spandau through the metro tunnels from the zoo area. In the area of the exhibition hall on the Maisoner Lee, she connected with the German units retreating from the Kufestindom. The units of the Red Army and the Polish Army stationed in this area did not engage in battle with the Germans breaking through from the city, apparently due to the exhaustion of the troops in previous battles. The systematic destruction of the retreating units began in the area of the bridges over the Havel and continued throughout the flight towards the Elbe. On May 2, at 10 o'clock in the morning, everything suddenly calmed down, the fire ceased and everyone understood that something had happened. We saw white sheets that were thrown away in the Reichstag, the Chancellery Building and the Royal Opera and Cellars that had not yet been taken. Entire columns were toppled from there. Ahead of us was a column, where there were generals, colonels, then soldiers behind them. It must have been three hours. Alexander Bessarab, participant in the Battle of Berlin and the capture of the Reichstag. General Helmut Weidling, 
The last commander of the defense of Berlin appointed by Hitler, surrendered on May 2 along with members of his headquarters, the last remnants of the German units were destroyed or captured by May 7. The units managed to break into the area of the Elbe crossings, which until May 7 were held by units of the 12th Army of General Wenck, and join the German units and refugees who managed to cross into the zone of occupation of the American army. Some of the surviving SS units defending the Reich Chancellery, led by SS Brigade Führer Wilhelm Monk, attempted to break through to the north on the night of May 2, but were partially destroyed, while the rest managed to get to Schenhoser Alley in the wedding area, where in one of the basements everything they, with the exception of those who committed suicide, were captured around 10.30 a.m. on the 2nd of May. Monk himself was captured by the Soviets, from which he was released as a war criminal without amnesty in 1955. Soviet troops defeated the Berlin grouping of enemy troops and stormed the capital of Germany, Berlin. Developing a further offensive, they reached the Elbe River, where they joined up with American and British troops. With the fall of Berlin and the loss of vital areas, Nazi Germany lost the opportunity for organized resistance and soon capitulated. With the completion of the Berlin operation, favorable conditions were created for the encirclement and destruction of the last large groupings of German troops on the territory of Austria and Czechoslovakia. The losses of the German armed forces in killed and wounded are not known for certain. Of the approximately 2 million Berliners, about 125,000 perished. The city was badly damaged by bombing even before the arrival of Soviet troops. The bombing continued during the battles near Berlin, the last bombing of the Americans on April 20, 1945, Adolf Hitler's birthday, led to food problems. The destruction was further intensified as a result of the actions of the Soviet artillery, which began on April 20th artillery preparation before the storming of the city. Three separate guards heavy tank brigades IS-2, the 88th separate guards heavy tank regiment and at least nine guards heavy self-propelled artillery regiments of self-propelled guns took part in the battles in Berlin, including 1st Belarusian Front, 7th Guards, 69th Army, 11th Guards, 5th Shock Army, 67 Guards, 5th Shock Army, 334 Guards, 47th Army, 351 Guards, 3rd Shock Army, Frontline Subordination, 88th Guards, 3rd Shock Army, 396 Guards, 5th Shock Army. 394 Guards, 8th Guards Army. 11 to 1st Guards Tank Army 15 362, 399 Guards. 1st Guards Tank Army. 11th Guards, 1st Guards Tank Army 16 1 MK, 2nd Guards Tank Army 17 347 Guards. 2nd Guards Tank Army. 23 Brigade, 9th Tank Corps. 1st Ukrainian Front. 383, 384 Guards. 3rd Guards Tank Army. According to the Tease Armor of the Russian Federation, the 2nd Guards Tank Army under the command of Colonel General S. I. Bogdanov during the street fighting in Berlin from April 22 to May 2, 1945 irretrievably lost 52 T-34s, 31 M4A2 Sherman, 4 S2, 4 ISU-122, 5 SU-100, 2 SU-85, 6 SU-76 which accounted for 16% of the total number of combat vehicles before the start of the Berlin operation. It should be taken into account that the tankers of the 2nd Army acted without sufficient rifle cover and, according to combat reports, in some cases, tank crews were engaged in combing houses. The 3rd Guards Tank Army under the command of General P.S. Ryborkod during the fighting in Berlin from April 23 to May 2, 1945 irretrievably lost 99 tanks and 15 self-propelled guns, which amounted to 23% of the combat vehicles available at the beginning of the Berlin operation. 
The 4th Guards Tank Army under the command of General D.D. Lyushenko was only partially involved in street fighting on the outskirts of Berlin from April 23 to May 2, 1945 and irretrievably lost 46 combat vehicles, 18. At the same time, a significant part of the armored vehicles was lost after the defeat from Faust patrons. On the eve of the Berlin operation, the Second Guards Tank Army tested various anti-cumulative screens, both solid and made of steel rod. In all cases, they ended with the destruction of the screen and burning through the armor. As A.V. Isaif notes, the mass installation of screens on tanks and self-propelled guns advancing on Berlin would be a waste of time and effort. The screening of tanks would only worsen the conditions for landing a tank assault on them, the tanks were not shielded not because the inertia of thinking interfered or the decisions of the command were absent. Shielding was not widely used in the last battles of the war due to its negligible effectiveness proven by experience. A participant in the Berlin operation, General A. V. Gorbatov, expressed the following opinion about the storming of Berlin. From a military point of view, Berlin did not need to be stormed, it was enough to encircle the city, and he himself would have surrendered in a week or two. Germany would capitulate inevitably. And on the assault, on the very eve of victory, in street battles, we put at least a hundred thousand soldiers. And what kind of people they were, golden, how long everyone had gone, and everyone thought, tomorrow I will see my wife, children. A significant part of Berlin, even before the assault, was destroyed as a result of British-American air raids, from which the population hid in basements and bomb shelters. There were not enough bomb shelters and therefore they were constantly overcrowded. By that time, in Berlin, in addition to the three million local population, which consisted mainly of women, the elderly and children, there were up to 300,000 foreign workers, including Ostarbeiters, most of whom were forcibly deported to Germany. They were forbidden from entering bomb shelters and cellars. Although the war for Germany had long been lost, Hitler ordered to resist to the last. Thousands of teenagers and old people were drafted into the Volkssturm. From the beginning of March, on the orders of Reichskommissar Goebbels, responsible for the defense of Berlin, tens of thousands of civilians, mostly women, were sent to dig anti-tank ditches around the German capital. Civilians who violated the orders of the authorities, even in the last days of the war, faced the death penalty. There is no exact information on the number of civilian casualties. Different sources indicate a different number of people who died directly during the Battle of Berlin. Even decades after the war, during construction work, previously unknown mass graves are found. After the capture of Berlin, the civilian population faced the threat of starvation, however, even before the end of the fighting, the Soviet command organized the provision of food to the inhabitants of Berlin, food standards were determined for various categories of citizens, a rationing system was introduced, and measures were taken to provide hospitals and pharmacies with medicines. In addition, humanitarian aid was sent to other German cities, Dresden, Chemnitz, Stettin. Roosevelt and Churchill, Eisenhower and Montgomery believed that they, as the Western allies of the USSR, had the opportunity to take Berlin. At the end of 1943, U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt, aboard the battleship Iowa, set the military the task of. We must reach Berlin. The U.S. should get Berlin. The Soviets can take territory to the east. Winston Churchill also considered Berlin a primary target. Soviet Russia became a deadly threat to the free world. We must immediately create a united front against its rapid advance. This front in Europe should go as far as possible to the east. The main and true goal of the Anglo-American armies is Berlin. Churchill, from Post-War Memoirs and back in late March, early April 1945, he insisted. I attach even more importance to the entry into Berlin. I consider it extremely important that we meet the Russians as far as possible in the East. Churchill, from correspondence with British and American commanders, according to Field Marshal Montgomery, 
Berlin could have been captured in the early autumn of 1944. Trying to convince the commander-in-chief of the need to storm Berlin, Montgomery wrote to him on September 18, 1944. I think that the best object of attack is the Ruhr, and then to Berlin by the northern route, since time is of the utmost importance, we must decide that it is necessary to go to Berlin and end the war, everything else should play a secondary role. However, after the unsuccessful landing operation of September 1944, called the Market Garden, in which, in addition to the British, also American and Polish paratrooper formations and units participated, Montgomery admitted. Berlin was lost to us when we failed to develop a good operational plan in August 1944, after the victory in Normandy. Subsequently, the Allies of the USSR abandoned their plans to storm and capture Berlin. Historian John Fuller calls Eisenhower's decision to abandon the capture of Berlin one of the strangest in military history. Despite a large number of conjectures, the exact reasons for the refusal of the assault have not yet been clarified. On April 2, 1945, the head of the OKH, Yodel, ordered General Max Pemsel to urgently fly to Berlin. However, due to bad weather, he arrived only on April 12 and found out that it was on the eve of him, they wanted to appoint him commander of the defense of Berlin, but he was late. And Pemsel was happy. In Normandy, he headed the headquarters of the 7th Army and was well versed in fortification. Leaving the capital, the general assessed the Berlin fortifications simply, extremely useless and ridiculous. 1. The same is said in the report of General Serov of April 23, 1945, prepared for Stalin. Soviet experts stated that within a radius of 10 to 15 kilometers from Berlin there are no serious fortifications, but in general, they are incomparably weaker than those that the Red Army had to overcome when storming other cities. It was under these conditions that the German garrison needed to repel the attack of two Soviet fronts. However, what was the Berlin garrison that stood guard over the capital of the Reich and Adolf Hitler personally? And he didn't represent anything. Prior to the departure of 56 TK to Berlin from the Silo Heights, there was practically no organized defense of the city. The commander of the 56th TC, Lieutenant General Helmut Weidling, saw the following, already on April 24, I was convinced that it was impossible to defend Berlin and from a military point of view it was pointless, since the German command did not have sufficient forces for this, moreover, at the disposal of the German command by April 24, there was not a single regular formation in Berlin, with the exception of the Gross Deutschland Guard Regiment and the SS Brigade guarding the Imperial Chancellery. The entire defense was entrusted to the units of the Volkssturm, the police, the personnel of the fire brigade, the personnel of various rear units and service authorities. In fact, the entire defense structure of more than 2 million Berlin rested on the miserable remnants of the 56th Panzer Corps. On April 16, 1945, on the eve of the Berlin operation, the entire corps numbered up to 50,000 people, including the rear. As a result of bloody battles on the suburban defensive lines, the Corps suffered huge losses and retreated to the capital, greatly weakened. By the beginning of the fighting in the city itself, the 56th TC had 18. Panzergrenadier Division, 4,000 people. Munchberg Panzer Division, up to 200 people, artillery and four tanks. 9. Falskim Jager Division, 4,000 people, having entered Berlin, the division numbered about 500 people, and was replenished to 4,000. 20. Panzergrenadier Division, 800, 1200 people. 11. SS Nordland Panzergrenadier Division, 3,500 to 4,000 people. Total, 13.000 to 15.000 people. Thus, at first glance, the capital was defended by 13,000 to 15,000 people of regular army formations. However, this is on paper, but in reality the picture was depressing. For example, the 20th Panzer Grenadier Division already on April 24, 1945 consisted of 80% Volkssturmists and only 20% of the military. 7. Can 800-1200 people be called a division? 
and if 80% of them are old people and children, then what kind of regular army formation is this? But in Berlin, such metamorphoses happened at every step, formerly a division is fighting, but in reality a small group of military men or a bunch of unprepared children and old people. The 20th Panzer Grenadier Division, due to its weakness, was sent to the 5th sector in positions along the Telta Canal. On April 38, 1945, during the assault on the Reichstag building, a group of Lieutenant Semyon Sorokin, Viktor Provotorov, Stepan Orshko, Grigory Bulatov, Rakims and Kosh Karbef, broke through to the roof with a fight, and at 1425 two fighters, Red Army soldier Grigory Bulatov and Lieutenant Rakims and Kosh Karbef, hoisted a homemade canvas on the facade of the Reichstag building. On the same day, at 21.30, units of the 150th Infantry Division under the command of Major General V. M. Shatilov and the 171st Infantry Division under the command of Colonel A. I. Nagoda stormed the main part of the Reichstag building. The remaining Nazi units offered stubborn resistance. We had to fight for every room. In the early morning of May 1, the assault flag of the 150th Infantry Division was raised over the Reichstag. But the battle for the Reichstag continued all day, and only on the night of May 2 did the Reichstag garrison capitulate. On May 1, only the Tiergarten and the government quarter remained in German hands. The Imperial office was located here, in the courtyard of which there was a bunker at Hitler's headquarters. On the night of May 1, by prior arrangement, the chief of the general staff of the German ground forces, General Krebs, arrived at the headquarters of the 8th Guards Army. He informed the commander of the army, General V. Ichukov, about Hitler's suicide and about the proposal of the new German government to conclude a truce. The message was immediately conveyed to G. K. Zukov, who himself telephoned Moscow. Stalin confirmed the categorical demand for unconditional surrender. At 6 p.m. on May 1, the new German government rejected the demand for unconditional surrender, and the Soviet troops resumed the assaults with renewed vigor. In the first hour of the night on May 2, the radio stations of the 1st Belarusian Front received a message in Russian, Please cease fire. We are sending parliamentarians to the Potsdam Bridge. A German officer who arrived at the appointed place on behalf of the commander of the Defense of Berlin, General Weidling, announced the readiness of the Berlin garrison to stop resistance. At 6 a.m. on May 2, artillery General Weidling, accompanied by three German generals, crossed the front line and surrendered. An hour later, while at the headquarters of the 8th Guards Army, he wrote a surrender order, which was reproduced and, using loud speaking installations and radio, brought to enemy units defending in the center of Berlin. As this order was brought to the attention of the defenders, resistance in the city ceased. By the end of the day, the troops of the 8th Guards Army cleared the central part of the city from the enemy. Separate units that did not want to surrender tried to break through to the west, but were destroyed or scattered. 